And do turn with me to page 1,220 in the Church Bibles and 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 12. One Peter four verse twelve. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, You're blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should be not as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear the name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we do pray that the words we have just sung would become living realities in each one of our lives tonight. We don't want to leave this place without having engaged with you and being met by you. And so, Lord, we pray that in your greatness and in your grace, you would stoop down and you would speak into each one of our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. (laughs) Professor D.A. Carson tells the story of a medical doctor, a former missionary, who was appointed an elder at his local church. Well, some time later, he had an affair. He divorced his wife, he abandoned his children. And he separated himself from any form of biblical Christianity. Now, of course, countless attempts were made to rehabilitate him, but all of them failed. And Dr. Carson goes on to say that the most thoughtful assessment of the whole sorry episode came some three years later from one of the elders in the church. And he suggested that this doctor, who had come from a Christian family, who'd done all the right things, had never, ever had to make a decision that it cost him anything. Everything was easy. At every point, he had been supported and praised. And even his missionary career was bound up with his own speciality in medicine. And then when some troubles opened up in his marriage, as they do in every marriage at some point or other, and an attractive alternative presented herself, this doctor had no moral center on which to depend. He'd never, for the sake of Christ, taken the decision that cost him anything. And it wasn't about to begin now. Now that story is tragic, but not surprising. And sadly, it can be repeated tenfold. So here's the question. How does a Christian develop the kind of moral center that Dr. Carson talks about? such that whatever may come their way, they don't lose their way. Well, the passage tonight shows us how, through what could be called good suffering, God provides just that. So I want us to take a look at this passage under three headings. First, God decreed 
suffering, verse 19. Now here's the climax of the whole section, which is the key to unlocking the rest of the passage. Peter writes, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Now, the category of suffering is a very broad one, and it, com- it covers a wide range of human experience. And one temptation for those who are religiously inclined is to make sure that their theology is so watertight it allows for no loose ends. Everything has got to be explained. And that goes for the question of suffering. And so some, in an attempt to exonerate God of even a hint of moral responsibility when it comes to suffering, say, it is never God's will for us to suffer. And if we do, then it must be because of Satan or because of a lack of faith. And God's doing his best. He's trying. But some things are out of his control, like suffering. Well, it seems to me that the book of Job, let alone a whole host of biblical texts, hits that nonsense on the head. While God is sovereign over all things, including the activity of Satan, he nonetheless permits suffering. And not all suffering is to be thought of in terms of desert or lack of faith, because none of those things apply to Job. On the other hand, there are those for the same motive of wishing to defend God against being weak, comparatively close to saying that whatever suffering there is, it is God's will, pure and simple. But this is to make God, say, to be the author of Auschwitz and Belsen, which is nigh on blasphemous. Now, while it is certainly true that all things come under God's sovereign sway, with God working all things together for the good for those who love him, Scripture nonetheless underscores human responsibility, including responsibility for inflicting suffering like that of the Nazis. So while Jesus and the cross was according to God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, It was the Jewish leaders, with the help of Gentile leaders, that were responsible for the dirty deed, according to Peter in his Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2. So the point is that things are more nuanced than some people suppose, including Christians. And yet here in verse 19, Peter does say that there is a, a kind of suffering which is according to God's will. Now, in order to pinpoint a bit more accurately what this kind of suffering is, which is according to God's will, it might be helpful to contrast it with suffering for those things which are not according to his will, that is, his moral will. And what that is, we see in verse 15. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. Now, what does he mean? Well, as we saw in chapter 2, God has ordained ruling structures in the world in order to punish wrongdoing, to legitimately inflict punishment or suffering on those who break the law. So as odd as it may sound, it is God's will that those who break his moral will against others in society should suffer for it. And that it has been given to the ruling authorities the power and the responsibility to make sure that happens. But a Christian should not be suffering for those kinds of things. Murder, stealing, criminality, or meddling. Now, what on earth does Peter mean by meddling? 
Well, one writer describes it in these terms. It is the censuring behavior of outsiders on the basis of claims to a higher morality, interfering in family relationships, fomenting domestic discontent and discord, or tactless attempts at conversion. That is meddling. In other words, it is that crass moral put-down that Christians sometimes engage in on those who aren't Christians. And they become censorious, and they adopt a high and mighty attitude towards them. And if you push that to the nth degree, it does cause resentment. It does cause unrest, and especially within families. Now, sure, if we are given an opportunity to speak God's word into a situation, we are to do so, and we're to do so humbly, but not in this kind of meddling kind of way. Do you see? Now, if that is the kind of suffering we're not to be associated with, what is the kind we are to consider to be good and decreed by God? It's there in verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. It is suffering for being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ that Peter has in mind as being according to God's will. Now, some have suggested that Peter is taking up a label others have applied to the followers of Christ, Christians, which they're using as a term of contempt, like fundamentalist, puritanical, or even evangelical, which at one time was a theological swear word. And of course, nobody likes name calling. You feel embarrassed by it, you feel uncomfortable, and, 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 and you'll tend to repudiate the label. Well, that, I, I don't fall into that category. Well, don't, says Peter. Embrace it. Don't be ashamed of being known in this way. Take it as a badge of honor. You're a Christian. And you'll do so for reasons which are going to become obvious in a minute. So the kind of suffering decreed by God is that which is specifically suffering for being a Christian believer. Which leads on to our second heading, good producing suffering. Now, in what way can suffering for being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ ever be conceived as producing that which is good? Well, we're given a clue in verse 12 where Peter speaks of a fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you. Now, here Peter is picking up something he said earlier on at the beginning of his letter in chapter 1 and verses 7 to 8 about trials which are designed to prove the genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. You see, God loves his treasure, that is, Christians. And he loves his treasure so much that he will not only polish it up so that it looks great, but he will refine it so that it is great. Now, this is how C.S. Lewis describes God's design into making us holy as he is holy. When a man turns to Christ and seems to be getting on pretty well in the sense that some of his bad habits are now corrected, he often feels that it would now be natural if things went along fairly smoothly. When troubles come along, illness, money troubles, new kinds of temptations, he's disappointed. These things, he feels, might have been necessary to rouse him and and make him repent in his bad old days. But why now? Because God is forcing him on or up to a higher level putting him in situations where he will have to be very much braver 
or more patient or more loving than he ever dreamed of being before. It seems to us it's all unnecessary. But that is because we have not yet had the slightest notion of the tremendous thing he means to make of us. Do you see? Now, Peter's been telling us exactly what God intends to make of us. A holy temple, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Little Christ, if you will, reflecting the goodness of God to a dying world. And the notion of Christians being refined also lies behind verses 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, that is the church. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, well, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, when Peter here talks about um, judgment amongst God's family, it's not primarily in terms of condemnation. Rather, it is to be understood in terms of evaluation, a sifting, a sorting out of the authentic from the inauthentic. Like when we say an art dealer judges between uh, an authentic Renoir and a fake, a copy. Now that is what goes on when the church is going through hardship, a sifting. Because profession of faith is one thing, purity of faith is something else. And this is how God establishes a moral center in us and exposes whether we have a moral center at all. And like the, moral, uh, like the missionary I mentioned right at the beginning. But what this judgment of Christians in the present does have in common with the judgment of non-Christians in the future is that both of them involve this evaluating of what we have made of our lives. Is it for God or is it for self? And also both involve suffering. The difference is that whereas for the believer the suffering is creative, as we're put into pressure, we rely more and more on Christ, as so we become more and more like Christ. For the unbeliever, the suffering, which is eternity in hell, will only be punitive. Now, of her experience in the dark days of the Soviet Union, when many Christians were imprisoned for their faith, one Russian believer wrote, my first 15-day sentence taught me a great deal about myself. In such a situation, you see your good points and your bad points very clearly. You find out where your weaknesses are. Persecution can be compared to a photographic developer. When the film is immersed in the developer, an image appears. When a Christian encounters persecution, his character becomes evident. Our church quickly learned who was ready for persecution and who wasn't. That's the point. If you were to be put into the developer, what character would emerge? But not only is such suffering good because it refines us to make us more like Christ, it's actually evidence that we are united to Christ. Look at verse 13. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now here, the identification between the risen and ascended Christ and his people are such that their sufferings are counted as his sufferings. Do you remember what the ascended Christ said to Saul as he was on that road to Damascus, throwing Christians into jail left, right, and center? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was persecuting the Christians, but in so doing, he was persecuting Jesus. Jesus. 
Such is the unity between true Christians and Christ. To persecute them is tantamount to persecuting him. Helen Rosevere was a Christian British medical doctor who served more than 20 years in Congo, in Africa. In 1964, a revolution overwhelmed the country. And she and her co-workers were thrown into five and a half months of the most unbelievable brutality and torture. For a moment, she thought that God had forsaken her. But then she was overwhelmed with a, a tremendous sense of his presence. And she recalls that it was as if God was saying to her, 20 years ago, you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary. The privilege of being identified with me. This is it. Don't you want it? These are not your sufferings. They're mine. All I ask is the loan of your body. So closely identified is the risen Savior with his people, so bound up is he with their welfare and they with his purposes, that when they suffer for the faith, their sufferings count for something. It's all part of the sign that the kingdom is growing, a kingdom which is always, always accompanied with difficulty and persecution and opposition. That is why Peter says we should rejoice now, because one day we shall be overjoyed when Christ returns, because that is the time when we'll see that all of it has been worthwhile. So why not engage in a bit of that rejoicing at the moment. But finally, what is the godly response to suffering? Well, there are a number of things which are littered throughout the passage. We're called not to be surprised when it happens, verse 12. This is what we have signed up for as people of the cross. Don't be surprised. We're also called to rejoice, verse 13 because we participate in Christ's sufferings, and therefore we do so gladly as a sign that we're actually converted. At least if you're being insulted for being a Christian and not just a pain-in-the-neck meddler, then at least the world, and certainly the devil for that matter, has recognized you are different from everybody else and you're worth dubbing. You should worry if you aren't in some measure getting it in the neck for being a believer. Because that might just show that you're no different from anybody else. You're just like the rest of the citizens in this world, and you're not a foreigner in this world. But thirdly, says Peter, you're to recognize that you're actually blessed. Verse 14. Because the spirit of glory rests on you, marking you out as his, and therefore giving you a strength to endure. Now, maybe at this point, Peter has in mind the final beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We've got to get it into our minds that it is the false prophets that are liked and always honored and spoken well of, not the true prophets. It's pure one Peter, isn't it? Yes, we're not to be surprised to be hassled for being believers. Yes, we should rejoice. Yes, we should realize we are blessed in a privileged state, which is the meaning of that word blessed. But the one thing we must do if we're to endure and excel is what Peter finally says in verse 19. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. 
commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Now let me ask, what might this look like? Perhaps something like this. The 18th century preacher Jonathan Edwards in the American colonies was the minister of a church of which his grandfather had previously been the rector, the the main minister. And this was a church that had seen at least seven revivals, I mean real revivals. Now perhaps you would have thought that with that kind of pedigree and that kind of track record of God's goodness throughout his ministry, then towards the end, everything would have been ended on a sort of note of great triumph. We would be wrong. After 22 years of faithful gospel ministry in which hundreds were converted, his congregation decided finally to kick him out. And they did so because he had the audacity to insist that those who took Holy Communion were at least professing Christians. And that was too much for some of the big shots in the local town. So together with his wife, his seven children, he was out on the street with nowhere to go. Well, eventually he did manage to uh, get a job. Remember, this is sort of last of the Mohicans country, for those of you who have seen the film. And the job he had was to teach a handful of Native American, Red Indians, the Christian faith in a remote mission out in the sticks, out in the wilds. And just when the corner of misfortune seemed to be turning and he was offered the post of the principal of Princeton College, he died at the age of 54, from a smallpox vaccination that had gone horribly wrong. His grieving widow, Sarah, then wrote down these words. What shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands over our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had my husband for so long. But my God lives and he has my heart. That is committing your life, yourself, to your faithful creator and continuing to do good. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you that you are a faithful creator, that there is no shadow of turning with you, that Lord, through all the trials and through all the tribulations we will have to pass through this world to the next, you remain the same You are good and you love your treasure, your people. And Father, we pray that in times of straits we would draw upon these truths we've been learning tonight. And where we feel we're lacking a moral center, where we're going all over the place, we would dare to ask that you would use pressure and difficulty to give us that strong moral center in which Christ will be exalted And Lord God, we will be able to bless your name. For these things we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.